me know if you can. There we go. Okay, so let me know if you have a hard time hearing me by shouting or something. Let me give you some context for what I want to share. Uh, today, if I were to title this message, I might call it something like um, uh, Joe versus uh, Franz Kafka. Uh, I want to give you a little context. For the past, I always think throughout the year in the back of my mind what I might share when my time comes up every winter. But a few months ago, my pastor asked me to get a bit more involved in my church ministry, which I happily said yes. And so I've been essentially um, about once every three weeks or once a month um in a sense, preaching to various parts of my community at my own church, be it the uh, main sanctuary, the main uh, uh, congregation, sometimes youth group, sometimes college and adult group. And I've essentially been giving, well, I suppose you just call them a sermon. Uh, and usually they just give me a certain pastors to think about. And I think about that for a few weeks and I give what I do. And uh, I, I'm going to, next couple of weeks, I'm, I, if you, I'm just giving some really qualified versions of what I've been sharing with very various parts of the church community. Uh, a few months ago, the part of the reading that we're going through at the time was uh, the book of Job. And so I would just want to share something that I've been, uh, I'm going to share with them, but that's been modified for your benefit. Um, a few preliminary, I mean, you guys know the book of Job rather well, and you're such a literate and thoughtful and erudite group. It's hard to, I don't mind me to patronize you, but just give me a little background. Uh, obviously, the book of Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. You know that already. Um, it probably, possibly, no, no one really knows how to date it, really. It, we, all we just knew, know so far seems to be it's very old. It possibly predated Abraham. The story probably predated the life of Abraham. Uh, it probably most likely began as an oral tradition that then later on got written down. Um, I think it's fitting that the book of Job is about pain and suffering or the question of theodicy or the problem of evil, which is why do good things happen to innocent people? I mean, I'm sorry, what do bad things happen to innocent people? And why do people suffer? Um, it seems fitting that that's such an old question that lies at the heart of all human existence. Um, suffering is a centerpiece. It's not the only thing. Joy, of course, and happiness, but friendship. But also suffering is really there. It's a stubborn issue at the middle of all our existence. So it seems fitting that one of the oldest and most ancient books of the Bible is dealing with this very subject. And what I like about the book of Job, as I read it again, is that it pulls out punches. It's just there. It looks at the question without being a hallmark card, without finding escape. It's just looking at straight down. And um, uh, so, yeah, there it is. I mean, I, I, let me just aside, it occurs to me that one could read the entire Bible as a book about the problem of evil and suffering. I mean, Genesis 1-1, you know, the garden story begins with a problem of suffering. Why do people suffer? Because Adam and Eve sinned, and boom, they're kicked out of the garden, and suffering begins. The entire Old Testament could be interpreted as the children of Adam and Eve doing bad things and then suffering as a result, and God doing them back. And then God solves the problem of suffering by having a suffering God in the middle of the Bible. The, the high point of the Bible is a suffering God. And then the Bible deals, then God brings a suffering narrative to a close with the, with, with the book of Revelation, where the new heaven and new earth were suffering. Ed. The entire Bible's narrative arc could be seen as a problem of suffering, how where it comes from, from how God solves it and how it ends. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just think suffering is just this perennial issue that's always there. Um, it seems to me it's hardwired into our human nature to be like Job. In many ways, Job is a person, but he stands for all of us. He's like all of us. Um, when we do suffer, we don't just suffer. We don't just, I mean, I, I think about um, animals that suffer, like dogs. I, I you know we all love animals, but when a dog suffers, it clearly yelps, doesn't like it. But I don't think a dog asks, like, why am I suffering? Why am I innocent? You know, I mean, I think uh, human beings, when we get hurt, I think like an animal, I think our immediate reaction is kind of like this primal sense that I don't like being hurt at all. You know, it, it hurts. But then I think the thing that makes humans interesting is that, you know, we'll, we'll go way beyond that and say, well, why am I suffering? Did I do something to deserve this? Does my suffering mean anything? You know, it does have any does any good come from my suffering? I think every human being is going to ask that question. We can't just let suffering happen. Um it has to mean something. It has to have some purpose. It has to come from somewhere. Um, I think about the book Frankenstein, which I read with my class. If you ever remember Mary Shelley's <laughs> or AP history classes or something, you know, Frankenstein's, this is, uh, in, in some ways, Dr. Frankenstein's a failed god. He makes this human being without really thinking through what he was doing. And the monster suffers alone a lot. And when the monster finally 
decides to do something about it, he travels across Europe to seek out his maker. And he has one question for his maker, like, why did you make me and why am I suffering? And of course, Dr. Frankenstein's again, like, kind of a critique of the uh, of enlightenment. He's a failed god. And Dr. Frankenstein's answer is, I don't know. I, I don't quite know why I made you and I don't know why you're suffering. I hadn't really thought through it. Our God's different, of course, but that human impulse to suffer and then find God and ask God, why is this happening? I think this is the center of all our existence. Even if, you know, all, all of us just want, we can't just take it, you know? I mean, we, we will take it, but we want to know what it all means. Uh, again, I think that's hardwired into us that our pain demands meaning and some explanation. Um, I'm reminded of Franz Kafka's book, The Trial. I'm not sure if you ever met, if you ever read that, but that's sort of something that a lot of kids read or people college or high school. I mean, the story of the trial, which I actually find one of the most horrifying books I've ever read in my life. The main character is a guy named Joseph K. He's fictional, of course, and takes place in 20th century Europe. And, you know, he's dragged before court by the police. And he the the the, the horrifying story of this story, the nature of the story is just so banal. He's accused of some crime that's really serious. And throughout the entire book, he's trying to figure out what crime did I commit and how do I get out of it? And throughout the entire book, he never finds out what crime he committed. And he's trapped in this Byzantine, complicated, legal uh, maze of, uh, of trying to make an appeal, trying to get himself out of trouble. And part of the problem is he has no clue what crime he committed, and the government will never tell him what crime he committed. Eventually, they let him off on parole, and they say at some point, at some point, at some time, you may or may not be called in to pay the consequences of whatever crime he committed. Eventually, by the end of the books, two men show up one day, the day before his 31st birthday, and they stab him to death with a pair with some butcher knives, and he's dead. And that's the end of the story. And it sounds like a really dumb story because nothing, it's, it's, in some ways, it's a very boring book. But maybe the horror of the book and the, the, what makes this just a terrible, horrific, scary book is that Joseph K. just dies. And even by the end of the book, we never know why he was killed or, or what he, crime he committed. And in what the end of the day, of that book again, that, right? the trial. what? What's that? What? What? I was just asking, what was the title of the book? It's oh, The Trial by Franz Kafka. I find, I mean, I watch horror movies you know i read scary books but i gotta say this is the most terrifying book i've read in my life it's horrifying because it's so boring and it's saying that your death means nothing why did why did joseph k die no one knows no reason is there something redemptive about his death no there's nothing redemptive about his death and he's forgotten he's dead and he's lying in the streets and he's forgotten that's all there is to it and I think Franz Kafka is an existentialist, of course. So this sums up his views on the world. There is no God. There is no meaning. There's no purpose. There's no overarching narrative that ties our life together. In many ways, the trial I could read as the anti-Job. I mean, Job is about suffering. And in the end, Job finds meaning in the suffering. I think Franz Kafka wrote this book as a giant, like a, about, a, a, as a giant rejection of Christianity, saying, no, actually, there is no God. There's no meaning, and your death at suffering means nothing. And that's just so horrifying. But that kind of dread that Franz Kafka wrote about, you know, in the 20th century is a kind of dread that Job and his friends are fighting against. I mean, so uh, I, I, I've been noticing that when people suffer, again, they just seem to want to know what's going on. They can't just say, well, I'm suffering. That's really bad. I think for there are a few exceptions like Nietzsche and the existentialists who can sort of take that, who, who accept that life is meaningless and suffering means nothing. But I think for the vast majority of us, we just demand suffering means something. We can't tolerate meaningless. meaningless. I mean, it occurs to me, this is a dark little thought I've had for many years now, that hypothetically, there is a God, of course, but hypothetically, if there were no God, then life would be meaningless. But I believe firmly that if there were no God, when we suffer, the human race, we would have invented a God just to give our lives meaning. I think we would have invented a narrative or a mythology or a religion, a false one, just to add some kind of meaning to our suffering. I think suffering produces religion. Um, it just has to, because the alternative is Kafka, the trial. It means nothing, and we just can't tolerate that. Firmly believe there is a God, there is a religion, that we, we have a true one. But it occurs to me if there wasn't, we, we would have invented one anyway. 
So, I mean, the part of Job I really want to focus it on, or rather I did focus it on when I delivered this sermon, was actually um, uh, Job 31, 4 through 6, and the context around it. But I just want to look at that one, those couple of verses. And Job says, does God not see my ways and count my, my every step? If I've walked with falsehood or my foot has hurried after the sea, let God weigh me in honest scales, and he'll know that I am blameless. So I want to think about the nature and, and what, what that verse is encapsulated in a larger debate that Job is having with his famous friends. And basically the debate, it, it, it comes across like a grand mythical theological intellectual debate of all these smart theological guys gathering together and having a big debate about the nature of life, the nature of God, the nature of the universe. Um, and the debate basically boils down to this. Job is saying, Again, the cosmic scales, let God weigh me with cosmic scales. Job goes down a litany of all the good things he's ever done, and they're rather impressive. And Job goes down a litany of all the bad things he could have done but didn't do. And then the big conclusion, of course, is, look, I'm giving evidence for why I'm a blameless guy. And by the way, the book of Job says he, at the, at the beginning, God says Job is blameless. He's an upright man, so he's not wrong or deluded. All the great things I've done. All the great, all the bad things I did not do. Ergo, I should not suffer. I should be living a prosperous life. Um, I want to notice something, though. I mean, Job never demands to God, give me back all the good things I've had. What his real demand is, explain to me why I am suffering so much in the light of the fact that I've done so many good things. His interlocutors, his opponents, the friends of Job, you know, they're ganging up on him. And their basic argument is, again, you know this already, but just bear with me. Their basic argument is, you have done something evil, and that is why you're suffering. Now, interestingly, Job lists specifically all the great things he's done. His friends can't list anything specific. They don't know what he's done badly, but they just know surely you have done something badly because you're suffering so much. Um. Job's what what I find really interesting about the argument, the more I think about it, is that actually Job and his friends are existentially on the same side. Both are actually arguing for the same point. Both Job and his friends are arguing that the world is just, that there's an order and structure to the world, that if you do good things, you will live a good, you will have good things in your life. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to your life. On that basis, either Job or his friends are they are in agreement. The only argument is what Job has done. And I think that what's really interesting is like, I, I, again, there, there's, I mean, let me back up a little bit. Both sides are arguing that there's like a natural order structure to the world. Like, let, let, me give, let me put it in modern language. Job would say something like this. If I cheated on my wife, if I committed adultery and my wife finds out, then she would leave me, take my kids and take half my money. I think Job would say, if I'm translating him in modern language, he would say, yeah, I hate that, of course, but I get what I deserve. Of course, that's what happened. It's like the natural result of what happened. Or Job would say, look, let's say I get drunk really night irresponsibly. I know better, but I just got plastered when I in a bar. I drive my car home. I wreck my car. I get terribly injured and I get thrown in jail for, de uh, for, for drunk driving. I would hate the consequences of my actions, but of course that happens. I'm not disputing the rightness of the consequences of doing stupid, dumb things or sinful things in my life, right? They, they, and he's saying like, that's just the way the world works. Both Job and his friends agree with that's how the world works. But the problem that they're really arguing against is that they don't want to live in a meaningless world or, or a world that doesn't seem to have the right consequences. consequences. Job is saying something like, because I'm a good guy and I had bad consequences, the world has gone amok. And his friends are saying, no, you did something wrong. It's like they're saying, it's, it's almost like what they're arguing for is like, there's some, it, I mean, the, the world structure, the system of the world might be analogous to the three law, Newton's three laws of motions or gravity. It's just built into the world. It has to be that way. And Job is kind of on the very edge of he's scared of being like Kafka, you know, and I mean anachronistically. 
saying if my my life demonstrates that the system of world that we all believe in has gone amok, it's broken. It'd be like if one day you wake up in the morning and gravity just stops working, you know? Or it'll be like if you woke up one day and all the structures of the world that made your pain and misery make sense just went bonkers and disappeared. And Job is telling his friends and telling God, I want meaning. It's not that he wants his life back, so he just doesn't want it back. But what he really wants is a world that makes sense, a world of meaning in which pain means something, which we understand what's happening in the world. And what I find so interesting is like the passionate emotion of his friends who are adamant. It's like they're saying, shut up, Job. Shut up. Shut your mouth. Quit talking. Or they keep demanding Job. And these are his friends. And they're saying, Job, just admit it. Just admit it. You did something wrong. And Job's like, I can't admit what I didn't do. But they, are demand they won't listen to him. They're demanding and demanding and demanding that Job confess something that he never did. It almost sounds like a communist cultural revolution where they're like demanding, confess, confess, confess. And I think the reason why Job is adamant is because, again, he can't accept the fact if Job, Job is saying the world, it's not just my life. The world has to make sense. And Job's body, his life is a threat. It's an existential meat threat to meaning. Because if Job is right, then the world's falling apart, and his friends cannot accept that. They'd rather have Job lie about a sin he never committed than accept the fact that the world's just not so, that the world's just broken. That doesn't make sense. I, I want to <clears throat> give an example, uh, and again, it's a rather dumb example, but it, it just keeps coming to my mind. About eight years, no, no, about, about six years ago, do you guys know what the ETS is, Educational Testing Service, SATs, AP exams, you know, does that... I know you guys are way beyond that, but you guys are aware of like MCATs and GREs, right? Those scans things. Well, there was just something like AP US history exam. And um, there's a portion of it that does essays. And um, in the essay section, they actually hire, hire human beings to actually grade these essays. So one year, uh, about, again, six years ago, I, I, I signed up to do this. And I have no love for AP exams. I have no love for the ETS. But they... For about seven days, uh, for exactly seven days, if I graded exams eight hours a day for seven days, they would give me a certain amount of money. And, you know, this year, for the first time, they actually allowed you to grade at home online. So I thought, yeah, why not? I mean, I, I thought I could use some money. And, I <laughs> it. and so I read basically my job was for eight hours a day for seven days. I would read the same darn essay written by high schoolers, the you know, yeah. scanned as a PDF. <laughs> What did you do wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was horrible. So, and and, and so I, I was like, rather excited, you know, I was kind of nervous. I started doing it after a couple, about about two hours. I thought, oh my goodness, this is boring. I was in my basement just reading these exams over and over again, and it was just horrifying. Except the only way to motivate myself, I thought, was I calculated how much I get, how much I get paid by the end of the eight seven days, and I broke it down to how much I get paid per day. Then I broke it down to how much I get paid per hour. Then I broke it down how much I get paid per minute. And I estimated how much I get paid per essay I read. And it was just so horrifying. It was, it was so dreadful and boring. But eventually I finished it and it was just bad. But I thought, okay. And, and then here's the dumb part. After the end of the whole thing was over, I was trying to get to the end. It was an ordeal. I wanted to get to the finish line. Oh, I did it. The last hour. I got an email from the ETS supervisor saying, you know, you're one of our higher, higher, highest rated graders in terms of your accuracy and your efficiency. We still have several hundred essays yet to grade. We would like to extend the opportunity for you to grade more. <laughs> and they said, we will pay you exactly this much money for every hour you work. And I actually said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so for two more days, I talk about existential dread of a meaningless universe. And I think for about two and a half more days, I graded. And at some point, I just said, I could have graded more. I said, now nah, I'm done. I'm done. And I think my mental, and my brain, I just made a mental calculus. Like, well, how much money do I want? You know, and I thought, okay, I want this much more money. At some point, I just decided that scale tip, I thought, you know, this is so miserable. You can't pay me more money to do this in my own, by my own little barometer of how greedy I was, I suppose. And so there it was. So let me tell you, so that's just one story. I'll tell you what I think it means in a minute. Uh, outside my office was a vending machine, and every now and then, when I lose my self control, I just you know put in two dollars. I type in a sixty four, and I get a little bag of Fritos. 
Um, this is an I, I think the ETS, the AP exams, and the vending machine is analogous to the world that Job and his friends are imagining. You know, again, their ETS does not love me. I had no, I never dealt with a human being. You understand? It was, it was utterly impersonal. I had no clue of the kids who wrote these essays. All I knew was if I do this job, I get paid this money. You know, it's utterly impersonal. It's mechanical. And in a couple of weeks, I got a check from the ETS and it was down to the penny what I calculated it would be. Exactly how much money or cents per mm -hmm. minute, per hour, per day, per essay. You know, it, it was fair. ETS did not say, you know, we love you so much that we're just going to triple your income, the money we're giving you just, just because we love you. That never happened. I wouldn't have said no. <laughs> Nor did they say, you know, just because we rolled the dice one day, we're paying you nothing. Ha ha, take that. You know, <laughs> that didn't happen, of course. But it was very, very mechanical. You understand? It was very mechanical. And I chose, I mean, at any, I, I chose how many minutes I worked. That's how I get paid. Likewise, the vending machine, A64, I get Fritos. The machine didn't say, you know, I got to give you eight bags of marshmallows instead. <laughs> We're going to take your money. That happens sometimes, but that's a broken world. Um, this is the world that, I mean, this is a primitive book. I think God's revelation is progressive, you know. This is a world Job and his friends are working under. And I, I think they're getting this from a kind of natural religion or natural revelation or natural law. This is a world that makes sense to them. I'll tell you something I find very interesting, and I'm being rather flexy with how I look at timelines. When Job was written, approximately, as we can guess, around the same time, there's a Greek philosopher named Her uh, Heraclitus. And Heraclitus is an ancient Greek philosopher, and he starts using, the for the first time that we find recorded in history, he uses the word logos. Now, Heraclitus is an early Stoic philosopher. Now, Stoicism, and by the way, as and I can't get this so much, around the same time in ancient in, in ancient India, we see the word karma pop up for the first time. So Job, Heraclitus, and karma. Job, Stoicism, and karma. Stoicism by so I mean, I'm gonna focus on the idea of Stoicism, but I think there's something almost stoic about Job. Stoicism and the idea of logos is this. The world is just is what it is. I mean, in many ways, the Stokes are anticipating scientific laws. The world's impersonal. There are laws. There are structures of the world. And you just deal with it. Now, Stoicism, I think, was developed in response to ancient pagan religions. I want you to contrast Stoicism with, like, say, the, the ancient uh, pantheon of Roman and Greek gods. Roman gods were... Well, basically, they're nuts. They're random. They are. They, 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 their their decisions are completely unpredictable. They're passionate, unprincipled beings. Um, one day you kill a thousand bulls for Zeus, and he might like you. One day Zeus sees a pretty blonde girl and says, "I like her. I'm going to impregnate her." And Hera gets all mad, so she curses a whole village around him, around the, the 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 woman that Zeus decided to have a crush on. You know, I mean. Stoicism, on the other hand, says, no, the world is not run by the irrational passion principles of God. It's set in stone like gravity. Let me give an example. Let's say you're standing on a beach and a giant tidal wave is about to annihilate you. If you're a Greek pagan, you just cry to Poseidon and say, Poseidon, save me. If you don't kill me, I'll kill a thousand bulls for you. A Stoic would look at the tidal wave and say, that is what it is. It's the principles of the world. This is called physics. You know, meteorology, winds, just die like a man and take it. That's all he can do. Um, I think Job seems to be leaning towards a stoic idea that if I did the right things, I should be blessed. Right? And there's something wrong with the world. There's something deeply wrong with the world. And his friends are arguing for that, too, because that's how they understand meaning in the world. Uh, because if that's not what they have... Then they have Joseph. Uh, then they have Kafka's uh, nightmarish world, that makes no sense. So I wonder. It seems to me the pagans and Job were caught between two impossible options. They have the Stoic logos, and they have passionate gods. In many ways, the Greek pantheon was like all the other ancient of the world. These gods just did random things that we can never really fully understand, and their their will was arbitrary. 
Um, the problem with living under the logos is that it's impersonal. It doesn't love you. Again, it's like, I mean, I want to imagine if you like fell off a bridge by accident and you cry out, law of gravity, have mercy upon me. Gravity doesn't care. You know, it, it has, it, it just does not care about you. Um, so that's kind of bad. The pagan gods, they might care about you. They might not care about you. They may intervene. They may not intervene. They might love you one day and hate you the next day. Both are nightmarish options, you know? It strikes me to use another biblical metaphor. One of my favorite images of the Bible is when the Jews were released out of Egypt during the Exodus, and they're standing between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's chariots on the other side. Option A, get drowned in the Red Sea. Option B, get annihilated by chariots. And they're like, okay, death by this or death by that. And God says, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the third option that you can never dream of. He parts a Red Sea. They pass through death. And they get sprinkled with water. It's like they're baptized. They come out of the end of the water as transformed beings, as the people of God. Um, God does something that no one would have ever anticipated. So I want to take that idea to, I mean, I, I, I love thinking about God as the God of the third option. Or the God as the a solution or the salvation that you would have never dreamed of. Um, you're caught between logos and passionate, crazy gods. And what God offers at the end of Job is not a solution, not a logical set of meanings, but God offers himself at the end of Job and saying, here I am, not a philosophy, but a person. So what I want to call Job God at the very end of Job is a logos with a face. It's like the law of gravity that actually loves you. It's not that God is not principled, but that God's <laughs> principle goes way beyond anything we can understand. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, I mean, I think this idea is anticipated by the Gospel of John, where he says, in the beginning was a word. The word was God, and the word was with God. We read that, we've heard that so many times in our modern context, and I think some of the meanings lost upon us. But if you think of what the logos means, by the way, in, by the way, the when he words lo, the word actually means logos, and being was a logos, a logos was God, the logos was God. Again, it, it's like what John is saying is something that just is unimaginable, that makes absolutely no sense if you're seeped in the uh, hell in this world of, uh, of, of pagan philosophy. He's saying that you have, it, it's like you combine the idea of principled a principled force of the universe and yet this force of the universe is loving is caring is passionate i think about who job is and job rightfully says i am a righteous man i'm blameless why am i suffering take me this is wrong in many ways thousands of years later there'd be another blameless person be even more perfect more blameless and he's suffering terribly this is christ of course and when he suffers, he tells God, yeah, I shouldn't. He, 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 Christ would have been right to say, like Job, this shouldn't happen. And it shouldn't have happened. But Christ says, yeah, but I'll take it. Bring it to me because they do not know what they're doing. In many ways, only Christ could do this because he is a Logos. It's a mystery that makes no sense. But only the Logos could take the law upon himself. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm i just fascinated with the idea that God is principle with a personality, the logos with a face. And I'll end it there. Hope that makes sense. Mike, your analogy of the vending machine <clears throat> um, has got me thinking that so many of the different philosophies and faith seem to be based on a transactional yeah uh, you know i do this and then i get this back and you know in my world as a marriage and family therapist and looking around the room all of us are married and you know do i love my wife because i made a covenant commitment to love her or do i love my wife because i know she loves me back you know that reciprocity um and, and and it's 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 hard for me to get away from a transactional model because it makes sense 
-hmm. And it gives me a choice. Mm -hmm. And, and I, don't, I, I don't know if God makes sense. <laughs> If it was transaction, we'd be dead. Yeah. Romans is quite clear. We fail under the law. And so, yeah, but God, I mean, I, only because God says, and Christ says, I am the law, I'm the logos. Can he actually do something about it? That's the third option. Speaking of marriage, I mean, it, it, somebody didn't include, but I was thinking about it. I thought it was a touchy issue, but like, um, I've had a few, I've lived long enough that I'm having, not a lot, but I've had a few friends get divorced or their, their marriages are on the rocks. And here's, I'm not sure about you, maybe I'm just horrible, but I don't dwell on it. I'm not gloating, but when that happens, part of me wonders, what did they do wrong? Hmm. What, did, what happened? I mean, I, where I look at, you know, I didn't see, I didn't see that coming, but I'm, I'm reading retroactively to like the seeds. I'm looking for seeds of destruction or, you know, the, the cracks in the foundation that may have been early on. And I think the reason why I do that is I want to know, I'm like Job's friends. I want to know what do they do wrong? Because I think what I really want to know is how am I different? You know, so I figure if they did something wrong, then I know I'm not doing that wrong. Therefore, my marriage is safe because I want to know that things make sense, that things aren't random. Does that make sense? Because my, Job my... is random. It makes them vulnerable to the same problem. They just don't want to believe in that. It's like in many ways we would opt to have the logos because at least we're in control because that's transactional. Like if I do this to God, then you'll say you'll protect me. Mike, in my professional life, I was always faced with the situation where <clears throat> a couple would give birth to a baby that had a heart defect. Oh. And you'd have the conversation. And I always told the husband, you have to tell your wife 10,000 times that it wasn't her fault because every mother will blame themselves for the outcome of their child. It's irrational, but yeah, they will. Yeah. And then I would look up for answers and ask why, and I never got an answer as to why. And it reminds me of an, uh, an episode of MASH where Hawkeye's best friend came. He was a soldier and got injured. Hawkeye operated on him and he died. And uh, Henry Blake was talking to Hawkeye. He said, well, Hawkeye, they taught me in command school that rule number one in men, uh, rule number one of war is men die. And number two is doctors can't change rule number one. Yeah, I remember that. That's a great line. I actually remember that line. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I think, and I always said to the family, I said, I don't know why you gave birth to a baby who had this, but someday I'll know. And that's that's how I got through the day. Someday mm -hmm. I think I'll know why. I just have never oh. figured it out, though. Yeah. And, and, and what's the fascinating about the end of Job is that um, God never tells you why. Yeah, I think it's such a. I mean, I, I think it's, there's actually something weirdly courageous about this book. You think well, God what, told what Job when he died? Tell Job is important. God, God doesn't tell him why, but he basically tells Job, "You are capable of understanding everything that I do or have done." Yeah, but do you think Job finally found out when he went to heaven? I think so. Hope so. If it even mattered then. I don't know. We, we've I, had. Go ahead, Ted. I'm sorry. We've had such an exercise in futility in Southwest Philadelphia over the past three or four months. Mm. It came out in the news again when the the commission that was uh, 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 impaneled to find out why the police were sent to 50th Street. North, North 50th Street rather than the South 50th Street when there was somebody was shot. And if they had heard right or if it had been spoken more clearly, they would have gone to South 50th Street and apprehended the crazy shooter that four days later shot four innocent people and we had a wonderful worship service at, at at, uh, uh, at salt and light, but that what an exercise in futility that the only explanations they give it, either the dispatcher wasn't clear or the police that answered the call didn't hear correctly. That and four people, four more people died. Mm. Now, if that isn't an exercise in, in, in futility, I don't know Ecclesiastes one. The temptation is to despair and go into um, 
Kafka's trial universe where, to put it bluntly, crap just happens and it means nothing. And it might appear to be that way. It's not, though. Our faith is that it doesn't mean that. Well, what it meant was that a thousand people were able to gather at churches in southwest Philadelphia and put their arms around each other yeah. and, and say, I love you. Yeah. That was the meaning yeah. that, uh, that God had for us in that event yeah. or pair of events. But what would the family members of those killed, would that be enough for them, Ted, or not? I, I don't know. It, it Unfortunately, like in Job's case, it has to be enough. Yeah. I, I have no answers, but I just... I, I think for me, the answer is putting myself, uh, putting my arms around somebody that, that's suffering and suffer with them. Mm -hmm. I also think a lot of us Christians um, include a little bit of karma mm -hmm. in our understanding. You know, well, God's going to give this person what they deserve or, uh, you know, what goes around comes around. And mm -hmm. maybe there's a little truth in that part of karma, but I can I can I can appreciate the appeal. What would that be? Buddhism or Hinduism? What is it? Uh, both, actually, but began with Hinduism, I believe. Yeah. Okay. And, and even the idea of. Um, of. Um, uh, block on when when you. Um, Logos? No, when you come back with another life. Uh, reincarnation. Reincarnation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, reincarnation. I can, I can understand the logic of that. You know, somewhere down the road, what you do good is going to pay off, and what you do bad, you're going to pay for. I, you know, that's, that resonates with me. It, it strikes me <laughs> that there's part of natural revelation in karma and logos. Not that we're not 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 that that no karma is right, but it, it comes from some human instinct to flee the Kafka option. It, it's just intolerable, and I think there's a reason why God made that intolerable, intolerable, tolerable for us on some gut level. Well, I, I'm I'm thinking about the Psalms that talk about you know God's judgment. I'm thinking of Matthew 25 when yeah yeah yeah, yeah you yeah. know um, the goats that didn't. Uh, or the people that are classified the ghosts that they didn't do the acts of kindness and mercy and and so so there is a little yeah element of that even sure yeah and i think it's natural revelation i think it's truth and karma in that god is not mocked you're right you're absolutely right yeah i think in we were studying the new perspective on paul way back when oh and 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 trying to and i just struggle with this but so 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 Paul basically says, and, and I forget what the, the name of this, uh, covenantal gnomism, is it? Mm. Um, in other words, Paul is saying, I don't follow the law because I think of life transactionally. And if I do good, then good's going to happen to me. I am joyful that I've been offered and I'm inside the covenant. And out of that joy... Uh, I, my response is obedience to the law. So I'm not obeying the law in order to be saved. I'm obeying the law because I'm joyful that I have been saved. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I found some solace in that. Um, I'm very fond of a song by Iris DeMint uh, that says, Let the Mystery Be. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with with her or the, her music, but um, a buddy of mine that's Jewish that knows that I'm very involved in the church uh, calls me occasionally and we have long talks. And um, after one of our talks, um, he texted me a link to Iris DeMint's song, which I thought was fun because he didn't know that I knew it. Um, <laughs> but, but the song basically says uh, something to the effect that I don't know, everybody wants to know where they've come from Everybody wants to know where they're going. But for me, I'll just let the mystery be. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, why don't you sing it for us, Al? <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen this morning. Tim. <laughs> that's not going to happen this morning. But uh, but I would be happy to. Uh, uh, I don't know how I would resend the link from a text. But in any case, point point being, uh, covenantal gnomism uh, and Irish demint. Um, <laughs> that's my closing argument. I'd okay. <laughs> We got a few I mean, look, there is an arrogance. Last minutes. There, there is an arrogance to all of this. The, the, uh, trying to understand things that are not understandable. Uh, that's that's what we're in pursuit of. And that, at the end of the day, that's where the let the mystery be, yeah. uh, you know, operates for me. <laughs> I love her voice. I, I just what, think what era would that have been from? Was that like a Jesus people of the seventies, or or is that more modern? It's now. Yeah. Is it, I, mean, I thought I, those words were. I think it's just Mr. McBee. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is she that, a Christian artist? Uh, no, no, she's no. just a popular artist, uh, singer songwriter. Huh. Yeah, singer songwriter. Yep. Our town. That's what our big no, song. Our town. Is. Okay. Yeah. Our town. Yeah, you guys would be familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, but where is Irish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, she's. I love her. I think she's got a great voice. Well, Mike, uh, thank you. Uh, look forward to the next two weeks. Could you uh, close this in prayer? Sure, I'd be happy to. Lord, we live in confusing times, and our lives will. People have always been suffering, Lord. That's part of our human fallen condition. We thank you, Lord, that Kafka's wrong, although we're tempted to despair. That in all things, you are the logos, and you tie the world together with meaning and purpose. But the meaning and purpose is not one that we can understand. And not that we're wrong, but we're far too limited in understanding of your purposes and the ways you organize your world. It's not transactional. It's not that if we do things, we will guard it and guarantee to avoid suffering. But in all your ways, you are just and good in just ways that are beyond our comprehension. So we cling on to not our understanding, but to love. And we know that we are loved beyond all comprehension. And may we be aware of your love. And may we love those around us in response. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. 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 Thank right. you, Michael.